Well, good afternoon, everyone. We welcome you to our lesson preview for this coming week. We welcome all of you that are out there online watching uh, this preview. We trust that uh, so far you've gained a lot from uh, uh, watching these previews. And our prayer is that uh, it will help you in uh, your lesson preparation and give you some idea of what uh, we have discovered and what you can use in your presentations in your classes. So uh, we appreciate you guys tuning in and uh, God is going to richly bless us as we study. So as we begin, let's uh, say a prayer and ask the Holy Spirit to help us understand these wonderful truths in Scripture. Heavenly Father, we are so thankful for the privilege we have of uh, looking at this, the lesson for this coming week. We are so grateful for the Bible, your word that uh, teaches us all about you. And we are going back uh, to uh, creation again, starting in the beginning of the word of God. And we just pray and ask that uh, the Holy Spirit will touch our minds and our thoughts and our lips, and as we speak, as we present, that those listening may catch what we are trying to say, and mostly what your word is saying to each one of us, is my prayer in Jesus' name, amen. So, as you all know, this uh, second quarter, we are studying the book of Genesis, and uh, some are asking, why are we studying this book again? We know it so well. We've gone through this a few times, haven't we, in the last uh, maybe a couple of years? Well, the book of Genesis is important for the Christian because it is the book that more than uh, uh, any other book anywhere helps us understand just who we are as human beings. And also, in Genesis, we find the truth, especially in this day and age when humans are thought of as nothing but accidents who are just part of the evolutionary chain. But in Genesis, the Bible simply tells us how everything came to be including human beings who were made in the express image of God. So, during this quarter, not only will we read and reread and study the book of Genesis again, but we will also enjoy its beautiful stories and learn to walk better with the Lord of creation, the Lord of Abram, the Lord of Isaac, the Lord of Jacob. And also remember that when we study and when we read God's word, the Holy Spirit will bring to our memories and always will bring to our memories uh, new insights, something we haven't seen before, throw new light on a verse that we may have struggled with. And it will also bring us strategies of how to fight the enemy, how to fight the enemy so that we can be victorious. Now, last week we began the first lesson about creation. In fact, this morning, that was our study in uh, Sabbath school class. This coming week, we will look at the fall of man in lesson number two and how we landed in this mess called sin. So, let us go uh, uh, to chapter three of Genesis to begin uh, our study. So, in this drama, 
In this drama that we are about to embark on, there are four players, four characters. We find the serpent, we find Adam, and Eve, and God. Only they were not acting. They were not acting. This episode was real and true. So let's start by looking at the identity of this first character, the serpent. Now, the serpent was a created being, and this is what Genesis chapter 3, verse 1 tells us. The first part of Genesis 3, verse 1 says, And the serpent was more cunning than any beast of the field which the Lord God had made. Now, the serpent, the snake, was a, a, a beast that was made by God. That word cunning means many things. The, this, this creature was, was beautiful. This creature was intelligent. And we must remember, too, that the serpent was known as, a, as a, an animal that was very attractive among all of the beasts, right? A clever animal, although it couldn't talk, because animals don't talk. Right? And then Isaiah tells us, I, I, Isaiah tells us in, uh, uh, in Isaiah chapter 14, verse 29, helps us a little more. And I, 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 Isaiah uh, says to us that this creature, he wrote and said it was gl a gliding serpent. Look what it says here in verse 29 of Isaiah 49. It says, do not rejoice, all you of Philistia, because the rod that struck you is broken. For out of the serpent's roots will come forth a viper, he says, and its offspring will be a fiery flying serpent. So, so here it's subtly telling us a little bit more about uh, the, 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 this uh, uh, serpent. And then in uh, the same book, Isaiah, the prophet, in uh, chapter 27, verse 1, says this. He says that in that day, the Lord with his severe sword, great and strong, will punish Leviathan, the flying or fleeing serpent. Leviathan, that twisted serpent, and he will slay the reptile that is in the sea. So yet yeah, just referring again to the Leviathan was a, a like a sea serpent, and and talking about the serpent and his cunningness and what he is going to do. The prophet gives a prophecy that towards the end, in the end, this serpent will be slayed. Will be, will, be, will be slayed. So, Ellen White uh, tells us a little bit more about the this, this serpent. Ellen White, in vision, this is what God showed her, and she penned it down in the book Patriarchs and Prophets on page 53. And she says, in order to accomplish his work unperceived, Satan chose to employ as his medium the serpent, a disguise well adapted for his purpose of deception. The serpent was then one of the wisest and most beautiful creatures on the earth. It had wings and while flying through the air presented an appearance of dazzling brightness having the color and brilliancy of burnished gold. So, yeah, Ellen White says how, uh, how the serpent was and presented himself there in the garden. He, he must have looked beautiful flying through the air, and when the sun caught his beautiful wings, it was just shimmering there. And uh, 
and he looked, it, it, it looked really, really good. So, uh, in the, the, the in, in uh, Revelation, the Apostle John said this in Revelation 2, verse 20, 20 verse 2, he said, He laid hold of the dragon. Now, the, we're reading of the last chapter in the Bible. First, we, the story comes up in Genesis. And right to the very end, we're still looking at the serpent. And here, John, on the Isle of Patmos, who wrote the last book, he says, he laid hold. Who laid hold of the dragon? An angel. An angel laid hold of the dragon, that serpent of old. Same, same serpent, same serpent. Who is the devil and Satan and bound him for a thousand years. So there's the whole connection from Genesis to Revelation. We know all along who that serpent is. It was the dragon. It was the devil. It was Satan right there in the garden. No mistake about that. No mistake about that. So, as we continue to read and finish, it, finish uh, uh, verse 1 of Genesis chapter 3, it says, uh, let's finish the, uh, well, let's finish it first, and then we'll go uh, to the next part. It says there that uh, it was uh, one to complete it. And I'm going, I think I, I will read that to you. And that same serpent said, God has indeed said that you shall not eat of every tree of the garden. So that's verse 1 of Genesis 3. Told us about the cunning serpent. And then the last part of that verse, he's talking. He's talking. This beast, beautiful creature is now talking, right? And he said to Eve, as God indeed said, you shall not Eve. You see, so Satan showed up there before Eve using that shape uh, uh, of, uh, of the serpent and calmly asked her to explain to him the meaning of the word of God. Well, what happened next? What happened next? Genesis chapter 3, we read verse 2 and 3. And so the woman said to the serpent, she's now having a conversation, she says, we may eat of the fruit of the tree of the garden, verse 3, but of the fruit of the tree which is in the midst of the garden, God said, you shall not eat, nor shall you touch it, lest you die. Hmm. She was, she was now talking and answering. And, and, she get it on. Satan was so cunning. The, the serpent was so cunning. He, 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 uh, this allowed him to openly just sow some doubts about God in Eve's mind. Because if we, if we continue to read verses 4 and 5, the conversation continues. Then the serpent said to the woman, You will not surely die. For God knows that in the day that you eat of it, your eyes will be opened. And here it comes. And you will be like God, knowing good and evil. You see, the serpent does not present himself as an enemy of God. Very deceitful person. On the contrary, the serpent refers to God's word, which he, he repeats God's word, 
And, and, and it see, seems that he's supporting God's word. That is, right from the very start, we can see that Satan likes to quote God. That's what he does. And as we shall see later, as we will see later, even quoting the word of God itself, verbatim. And we know that in Matthew, in the book of Matthew, when he was tempting Jesus, he responded that way. It is written, he said. It is written. He knows the scriptures well. Now I have a question for you. I have a question for you. Uh, if Satan was able to deceive a sinless Eve in Eden, how much more vulnerable are we? How much more vulnerable are our parents? Uh, how vulnerable are our children, our loved ones? And so the question becomes, this is real. He, 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 he is a, the great deceiver. And so we want to know what is our best defense against his deception. He came to Eve that was sinless. She fell. What about us? What is our best defense against these de deceptions? Well, I can think of some ways we can fight him. Though not us, but with God's help. We have to be vigilant. We have to watch. Don't keep your head in the sand or in the ground. Don't follow others. And we have to teach that to our children too. Seek God constantly. Don't compromise because he is deceitful. He is deceitful. Ask the Holy Spirit's guidance daily. And trust in God's word. And we have to teach this to our children. In the Old Testament there, in Leviticus, God asked those, our first uh, our parents, as it were, to teach it to their children when they go to bed, when they wake up, when they walk in by the road, talk to them about me, instruct them of how to live. It's serious because the devil is a, is a force in the end. He already won. But then we know they, there was a conqueror in the end. But if Eve and Adam and Eve could fall, who then never sinned in their lives. Who are we? We need God's help constantly. Always remember the devil's M.O. The devil's M.O. Uh, he, he has, he has two, two things. Satan's attack concerns two issues. That's what he has. Two issues, and, and the one issue is death and the knowledge of good and evil. That's what he said. He told her, you will not surely die. You will not die. Don't worry about it. You won't die. That's what he said. And then he has two arguments. He has two arguments, and they are immortality and being like God. You see, if a person doesn't die, it means you're immortal, and only God is immortal, right? At least that's what we, we know, we should know, you know. Remember, he's, he's MO. He's a master of disguise and deceit. He's a master of disguise. He doesn't come to you as a devil with two horns and a long tail and a big long fork and runs around and says, hey, here I am. Why don't you steal that? Why don't you say that? Why don't you do this or that? No, he comes very, very stealthily and well-dressed. He used it in the beginning and he still uses it today. 
very effectively right here in these last days in which we live. So I write poems when I can. I'm an amateur poet writer. And I wrote something about, about the devil. And it's called, if you want to have a copy of uh, this poem, if you like, uh, see me or, uh, or let me know. I can make you a copy. But I just wrote a short poem, a little amusing, but I thought it's on the topic. And so this is what it sounds like. It says, there are far too many people who think the devil is a joke. They say he lives in outer space and never comes down here. But I would have you think again, especially younger folk, that he is very much alive and busy everywhere. You see, he's so much smarter than those who think they're wise, for when he comes to tempt them, he knows exactly how. He has a thousand costumes to use in his disguise, so when he makes his entrance, it is what's in vogue right now. Please be aware, my faithful friends, the devil does wear Prada. Besides his fancy clothing, his melodic voice is oh so sweet. And by the way, he loves the clothes that comes from quaint Granada. So if you don't stay on target, he'll always sweep you off your feet. There's one more thing to watch out for. He's never harsh or crude. His modus operandi is to keep you calm and cool. So he never really acts abrupt and is frankly seldom rude. And while you're unsuspecting, you're sitting in his school. So Christian friend and everyone, take heed. The devil's real. He comes in every human size and in fabrics of all kinds. We need the Holy Spirit's power to stay on even keel. Then pray earnestly to Jesus to fortify our wayward minds. So that's just something to think about. He he's a master. He comes to you. It's very, very smoothly. So now, what was, what was Eve's reaction? What was Eve's reaction? <sighs> we, we just saw in these, these first five verses, right? Satan offers Eve something that he couldn't have. He's offering to her immortality and divinity. He's saying to you, you won't die. You're immortal. And hey, by the way, if you eat this fruit, you'll be like God. You'll be divine. That's what he, what he, what he uh, was, was saying. So in 1 Timothy 6, 15, uh, 16 says this, which he will manifest in his own time, he who is blessed and, only, and the only potentate, the King of kings, the Lord of lords, who alone has immortality. Only God has mortality. Dwelling in unapproachable light, whom no man has seen or can see, to whom be honor and everlasting power. Amen. Only God, only God has divinity. Only Jesus has divinity and mortality, immortality. Then in Isaiah, the prophet says in verse 14, he, the devil, said, I will ascend above the heights of the clouds. I will be like the most I hear this desire already up in heaven when he tempted the angels there. So, when he came to Eve, Eve thought that that really was desirable. She thought that was achievable. Hey, if I eat this fruit, this is what this beautiful creature is saying, I can really be immortal. And I can be like, that sounded pretty good. That sounded pretty good to her. So, 
when we, when we read uh, uh, verse 6 of Genesis chapter 3, that's exactly what she thought. Because in verse 6 it says, she said, uh, so when the woman saw that the tree was good for food, that it was pleasant to the eyes, and a tree desirable to make one wise, she took of the fruit and ate. And then, of course, she also gave her husband uh, some with her, and he ate. So that's what happened. She succumbed to that lie. She thought, nah, this, is, this sounds good. This sounds good. That if I can be smart, if I can be wise like, like God, that would be great. That's how she, she reacted to his approach to her. What was God's reaction? What was God's reaction? Well, I, before I even go to God's reaction, what, what, do you, what do you think? What do you think? The question for us to consider. Does, does their response sound familiar to you? Well, we'll find out. So, here comes God, and God uh, calls them. They find that they are naked, right? They, they found that now they ate the fruit, so suddenly something happens to them. They find that we don't have any clothes. They don't have any clothes. And uh, so, so God comes along, and now God is looking for them. And they are nowhere to be found, right? So in verse, um, verse 9 of chapter 3 of Genesis, Then the Lord God called to Adam and said to him, Where are you? Where are you, Adam? And then in verse 11, And he said uh, to him, who told you that you were naked? Because Adam said, uh, I heard your voice in the garden and I was afraid because I was naked and hid myself. Then God asked him the question. First he said, where are you? Now, now he's asking him, How, who told you that you were naked? Have you eaten from the tree of which I commanded you that you should not eat? God is asking the question. And he answers, and the man said, The woman whom you gave to me, with me, to be with me, she gave me of the tree, and I ate. And I ate. So they, their answers were trying to, to like conceal their sin, cover up. <laughs> That's what it looks like, right? Their answers were like covering up. They, 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 they pleaded self-justification and blaming others. Blaming others. The woman said, it's, it's the serpent that, that was in the garden that got me to, to do this. That got me to do this. Now, so now comes the question again. Does their responses sound familiar to you? When do we do that sometimes? Do we uh, uh, blame others, play the blaming game for when we sin or when we do wrong? Our kids will do it, though, right? Not the older ones, but the little ones. When they, uh, no, he, if, he didn't, if he didn't take my, 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 my bike, I would not have done this or that. If, Mom, if you didn't uh, make me do that, I, I would. It's always a blaming game. We never own up. We confess up. So, so, so Adam and Eve felt deceived. See, there they were. So, so why do you think? Another question we'd like to ask: Why did, why did God come looking for them? And what was the significance of His question? Where are you? Didn't He know where they were? And, and why did he even come? Why did he even come? Well, what, 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 what did God, why did God do that? Why did God do that? What was God's intention? 
in coming to, to, to seek them out. What was his intention? Well, he came to redeem them. That's what he was. When you, when you look at what happened there, God was coming to redeem them. To, in, in other words, to get them out of this mess now that they're in. That they're in. And so God was going, coming after them. And he wants even us today to acknowledge. Just like he wanted them to acknowledge their sin. So that he can offer forgiveness. And he can offer them restoration. To offer them redemption. That's what the word redeem means. I'm, sh I'm sure you know that. He came after them, like he still is coming after us today. God is always seeking us out. What are you doing there? Where are you? Why are you here? You shouldn't be there. How far along in your Christian experience are you? I'm looking for you. That's what God is doing day by day with us. Day by day with us. So we read this beautiful uh, uh, text in Scripture. We go to 1 John 1, and I don't, don't think I have a slide on that. But we can go to our Bibles, right, to, before we get the Revelation, right in the back. 1 John, and you know it very well. Uh, 1 John chapter 1, and we read verses 8 and 9. The reason why God came out to seek them. Verse 8 says, 1 John 1, 8, If we say that we have no sin, we deceive ourselves, and the truth is not in us. In other words, we are sinners. We are sinners. Like the pastor's preaching this morning, we're not perfect. But sometimes we act as if we are. But we all are sinners. And we have to acknowledge that. And then verse 9 comes and says, and if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. That's what he does. He wants to come after us so that he can point out where we are going wrong. And he uses the Holy Spirit to do that. So when we see our wrong, when we come closer and closer to him, we see our wrong, that the time when we need to confess. And when we confess, the scriptures clearly says, and when we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us. That's why he came after Adam and Eve. That's why he's still coming after us today. Acknowledge where you are. Acknowledge when you've done wrong. Because I can offer you forgiveness when you do that, when you acknowledge your sin. There's no point in covering it up. Then I can't help you. But come to me. I am I'm still there. Don't hide from me. I can see where you are. And I don't want you to be there. That's not a good place to be. That's not a good place to be. So, uh, in the end, uh, what was the result of this story? We can say many more things, but remember, we, we're giving you some things to look at. You study your lesson and let uh, the discussion progress as you see fit. So now we get to, to uh, the last part of this lesson. What was, what, what was finally the consequences of, uh, of the parties concerned here? Well, there was a curse and there was a promise. Satan was cursed by God through the serpent because he was the one responsible for the existence of evil. He was the one. And so God cursed him. Genesis chapter 3, 14. We don't have time to read that. You read it. You'll see. Then, then God made a promise. And this promise had a, uh, was a threefold prophecy. 
and he spoke to the serpent. He said to the serpent, the woman, the serpent and the woman, he said, there would be constant hostility between you, Satan, and the church of God, referring to the woman. That's what he said. And then he said, the offspring of the serpent and the offspring of the woman, what was going to happen? There would be constant hostility between believers and non-believers, between the children of God and the children of men. We read these responses in Genesis chapter 6. The seed and the serpent, he said that Satan bruised Jesus by hanging him on the cross, but Jesus will eventually destroy Satan. Genesis 3 verse 15 is that famous uh, curse that had that promise in it. In Genesis chapter 3 verse, uh, verse 15, when he said, and you know the verse very well, um, he said, I will put enmity between you and the woman and between your seed and her seed. Ye shall bruise your head and you shall bruise his heel. And that's exactly what played out uh, on the cross. Satan got, got the death uh, th uh, that he rightly deserved in Jesus' death. He could no longer uh, tempt forever God's people and those who come to him. And, the, and so he bruised the heel of the woman, the church, but his head was crushed, crushed when Jesus died on the cross. There was also uh, amidst the death, amid the death, there was also um, Uh, amid, uh, there was also the childbirth, he told the, the woman, would be painful. He said that the earth was cursed for Adam, the head of the household. And amid death and the return to dust, we have eternal life through Christ, who died for all mankind, is what we said. So that, in a nutshell, is a preview for this coming week. There are these four players. We see how they acted out. There were consequences. There were curses and promises. There was death. But in that death came hope. Because Jesus finally won. And he wants us to be victorious. So as we study this coming week, I know that you're going to find uh, a lot of new insights. Work on that because that's what the lesson wants to betray to you. Father, we thank you for giving us the privilege and the opportunity of looking at some of these high points. There are so many. We need hours and hours and hours of study to appreciate it more fully. But we pray that as we study this week into this lesson on the fall, like we were talking about how it came about, how the responses were, what the responses were, we know the enemy is out there deceiving each one every single day. There's some temptations lurking out there. And he's so good at knowing how to get us. Please help us, Lord, to ask the Holy Spirit to lead and guide us, to show us how to overcome these uh, temptations. And I know that uh, we will be successful because you've promised that we will be successful as long as we stay close to you and depend on your word. Is our prayer in Jesus' name. Amen.